Okay. okay. We're, We're back. back. We, back. I, guess I guess we planned, planned this video idea, idea like, like two, two weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yes. It's it's time. Time. So, so today's, today's video, video, again, thank you, Mr. Murphy, for doing this. this hey, thanks for having me back. Oh, I always look forward um, to it. Today's video, we are going to discuss uh, five influential books. And so none of these books will be in a particular order. I, I didn't rank order mine. I didn't either. They're so different. Yeah. Mine are very different. So all five of these books will just be books that we found influential. So I guess first thing we'll do here is we'll talk about and discuss what influences. Sure. Okay. Do you want to go first? No, you go ahead. Okay. So for myself, the criteria used for determining what an influential book was primarily the impact it had on my perspective, secondarily the impact it had on my actual life, and lastly its relatableness. Yes. So relatability. So in terms of perspective, what I mean by that is if a book is capable of changing my perspective and thus changing the way I not only see the world, but the way I move through it, it can become influential in my life. Right. So, so a couple of these books really shifted my perspective, um, and I'll let you guys know specifically which ones that is. Impact is also if a book made me shift the way I behave, it was compelling. It leads to actual progress and forward movement. It then transcends the category of self-help and into the realm of progress and action. So not just because, you know, obviously we discussed this at some point. Some people just get into the self-help and then just keep reading self-help. Yes. <laughs> but are you actually extracting an idea from the book and then implementing that into your life? If you're not, uh, for me, my criteria, well, then the impact is minimal, right? Yes. It's, it's nice to have good ideas, but if you're not actually acting on them in my for me, it's just not enough. Last one is relatability. If it was written with simplicity, but also narration, it becomes relatable. That means I can give this book to someone else and they too might benefit from the knowledge gained from it. So, right. you know, am I recommending anyone read, you know, the Iliad? No, right. I haven't read it myself. Yes. And I'm sure it's probably a great book and has a great story, but obviously, you know, you want uh, for myself. It's like I want a book that someone else might actually read, pick up, right? So, and get so out of Aaron Clary's uh, what's that book? Oh, it's it's slipping my mind, but I lent it out to some students. But uh, Bachelor Pad Economics, yes, yes, right? yes, that's like Bachelor Pad Economics. Very easy to read, very yeah. high relatability. There's a lot of perspective given to you, and it can have a tremendous impact. It absolutely, particularly like on the vehicle front, right? Yes, like if you choose. To read that book and go, oh, maybe I don't need to lease a brand new vehicle. I'll buy a beater, learn yeah. how to fix it. Could change your life. Absolutely. Right. Set you on a little different path. Yeah. And actually, and that was kind of how when I was thinking about the influential, it was very similar in that trying to think about which of the books Im impacted my perspective, which one impacted my actions, and then especially because like we were talking about, I kind of try and keep a bit of a tally of the books I've read and and some of the key quotes and stuff that really struck me from them. And when I went back and was reading through that list in kind of preparation for today, I really, there were a few that stood out to me as, do you know what? I can still remember the moment I read that book. I can remember the moment I read that quote and it set me on a little different trajectory. And, and I talk about a few of them and those were the ones that I kind of focused in on. And I like your idea about having it be impactful for somebody else. And for me, these were kind of ones that, you know, it, it probably has to do partly with what I was going through at the time and where I was in life. But I just know for me, it was kind of something about them was very impactful, very meaningful at that point in my life. And it, and it did, it just kind of set me off on a little different path and it changed my actions and it changed the way I thought. And, you know, it mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. It's been, it's been really impactful for me. So that's kind of how I chose. That's, that's interesting because, you know, I, I don't have a great memory. So sometimes yeah. it's like, oh, I recall reading this and I recall being yeah. enlightened in a particular way. But I guess, yeah, when, once you really get deep into the self-growth, self-help kind of stuff, a lot of it blends together. It's like, oh, I've heard this somewhere or yes. several sources. Or several yeah. places. And that was it when I read through that list and there were so many of them where I'm like, oh, that was a great quote. That was a great book. But I haven't thought about it since I read it. And that I think, and that for me falls in one of those self-help books where I obviously thought it was important at the time, but it didn't really stick with me in that it, it had, didn't change. It obviously wasn't as impactful if I haven't thought about it in the three years since I read that book. So, yeah, you know, yeah. for me, it was kind of actually an interesting exercise going back and looking at 
wow, at the time, you know, I spent a lot of time reading a lot of these books that maybe didn't really impact me. And why was it that these ones did? Mm -hmm. That is fun to look back. And there is an author here who didn't make my, like, because I kept the runner-up list to three three so did I. authors. Yeah, so did I. But there's an author who didn't make it on this list, which thinking back was like, holy, no, wait a minute. Like, that was that, that it's because it's about Stoic philosophy. It's like, no, no, that was so important right. at that time. Right. Um, Okay, okay. So, so I guess, I guess we'll, we'll just go into yeah, our first in. book. Do you want to go first or? No, you go ahead. Okay, so, so book, book one, one, we'll write that down at 530. Okay, okay so, so my, my first, first book is called Musashi yes. by Eiji Yokishawa. So just a couple of bullet points I have here. So story of a phenomenal young man who pursues excellence and dedication over everything. Literally, like this guy has women throw himself at him. He has students throw himself at them. Like they tell him like, hey, build a school. Uh, all this success, but he's just constantly like, I need to get better at mastering this art of, you know, his art is violence. Okay. <laughs> uh, so he's just, his full name, Miyamoto Musashi, right? So he, he's a, an actual samurai, kind of a Ronin style samurai. Uh, so he is a real individual, but this story itself has elements of both reality and dramatization. Okay. Uh, uh, desperate, desperate to prove himself, he has to learn to climb the social ladder through the tried and true method. And what I mean by that is, so this book opens up kind of like in the imperial period of Japan, before they had unified, there's all these warlords who are vying to secure all of Japan and, and, and ascend to the top. And so there is the final battle be, between uh, Tokugawa Ayasu and his last rival. And Musashi thinks that him and his buddy can just go to this battle, kill a couple dudes, and just be elite and like, oh, people will respect us, right? Battle goes horrible because he's on the wrong side, right? Yeah. And Tokugawa's crew wins, but he slowly learns this process of, oh, I can't actually skip that ladder. Like we talked about that yes. in our first chat as well. That right. It's like, oh, I actually have to get a master, learn how to fight and learn how to duel and, and learn how to really discipline myself. Yeah. Uh, he, he spends, spends a year in isolated prison, prison which, which is transformational for him because like the first couple of months, he's, he's basically, basically just screaming in, in, in agony and pain and just like, like I don't want to be here. But once he does settle down, if I recall correctly, he starts reading a lot, right? Or he starts meditating, one of the two or both. But he spends an entire year, maybe, maybe more, but I do recall one year for sure in complete isolation. No one speaks to him, no one looks at him, no one touches him, you know, and he's like in a basement cellar, right? Now, I, I, if that actually happened, I don't know, but something happened to this young man at an early age that really shifted him from the rest of the people around him at the time. He continuously strives to find new mentors and people who can elevate him. So there's this particular scene midway through the book where there, he Musashi learns of this master and he's desperate to get his mentorship and learn how to better handle a sword. Right. But unfortunately, this master has retired into his old age and doesn't really want to deal with students. He lets his sons do that. And so Musashi being insistent, he, he writes him a letter and begs him like, please, like, you know, this is kind of what I've done. This is what I hope to do. Please. Like, show me, teach me. I want to learn from you. Yeah. And, and this, this scene, scene is, is so fascinating, so, so intense that he, the master responds with a letter. And the letter is irrelevant, right? Because he says no. Basically, tells him, like, no, I'm done. Like, right. I don't really care who you are. It's great that you're doing this. I wish you all the best, but my sons are more than capable. And he attaches on the letter a flower that was cut. And so, and so the scene is basically painted, painted. This, this maid gives him, gives Musashi this letter at the hotel. He kind of ignores the letter and he looks at the, the, the stem that was cut and immediately pulls his sword out so quick that this, this poor woman doesn't know what's going on. He cuts a flower and draws his sword back in. This lady screams running out of the room like this guy's a maniac, he's gonna kill me. And he just sits there, he stares at these two flowers, these two stems that were cut. And, you know, in his response, then he says, no, 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 like, listen, you don't understand. I am a, an accomplished swordsman, but your level of accomplishment is so much higher than mine. It's just so evident in the way this flower was cut. Wow. Like something about the way the guy cut it, it was so yes. precise, so pristine that, that, you know, and it's just, again, wow. just this, cool. this, this ability to recognize greatness on the spot. Like he's right. staring at it, like, you know, the, the maid's kind of like, what the hell is this crazy guy doing? What's the difference? Right? Yeah. You're just looking at two cut flowers. You're a psychopath, right? And she leaves, but... Isn't that um, interesting? 
And the last point, so he pursues excellence in his craft over money, women, position. You know, he, he, he does kind of have a school, but he was still kind of known as more of a wanderer and, you know, never really settled down. But, but this story is incredible. So I don't know if you know who Jocko Willink or Tim Ferriss are. Yeah, I mean, Tim yeah. Ferriss. Yeah, Tim Ferriss. So, yes. so the two of them did a four-hour podcast on this. So when I saw the podcast, I was like, oh, I know Miyamoto Masashi. They, they give, give like, like a 20 minute, minute blurb at the start of like, hey, you should really read this book. Yeah. And, and why you should do it. it. And, and I, I hit pause, pause and I've got, got the book. book. And, and one, one year, year later, later I, I, I listened to the rest of the podcast. Oh, really? After you read the book? Yeah, it's like a thousand page book, right? And it's very densely packed. Yes. And so it took me a year to read the book yes. just over time. But, you know, two people whom I very much admire, Jocko Willink being a retired Navy SEAL, mm-hmm. uh, Tim, Tim Ferriss being a... Uh, one of the one of the most popular podcasters, authors, both very successful. Yeah. Two people I'd like to emulate, and it's like, okay, like what is this book that they're reading? Like, let me go into that. But so, what was it about that book that struck you so much that you found so influential? Which is like, his story is so compelling. He, you know, he does the things that you're not really told to do. So, so, so like after, after that, that first battle, battle at the start, him and his yeah. buddy are kind of rescued or whatever. They. they they're unconscious they wake up after the battle's over and basically i think they're woken up by these two women who are like scavenging armor and trying to sell stuff and metal and so they live with this this woman and her daughter for a while and you know it's basically like easy sex someone's cooking for them cleaning their lives are easy and eventually masashi gets fed up and he's like this is, this is not who i'm supposed to be he leaves, but his buddy stays. And you just see these two life paths of like, one guy just chose to be complacent and one guy continued to pursue. So it's like, mm, you know, the advice of like, well, pursue excellence, not women. It's like, hey, have a mission and a purpose and keep pursuing that. And it's fascinating because the world slowly bends to him. Right. Right. The more he continues pursuing his excellence, he's offered more opportunities. He, he, he has mentors, he has mentees, he right. has women throw himself at them eventually yes. he gets very high recognition because people start to realize like oh this guy's really good at fighting you know and he and he's very good at teaching as well but just this story was so compelling of this young man who, who matures on his own through mentorship through, through really internal struggle and yeah fixing himself you know there's this scene there's another scene where he he's like passing i think after that master rejected him he's passing to another village and he sees this mountain and, and you know it's kind of like a schizophrenic episode where he's like oh the mountain is this old man and it's it's mocking me i have to conquer this mountain so he climbs up this mountain like you know he doesn't have climbing gear he's like barefoot he almost dies in this process but he tells himself it's like i have to do this I have have to overcome overcome this obstacle. obstacle. Like there's some some internal internal struggle struggle, that he's always dealing with. And again, just that idea of pursuing excellence in whatever area it is, right? His his was, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. One of the results was killing people, but it was mastering the weapons. Right, exactly, whatever his craft was. And he kind of finishes his life as a bit of a philosopher. So he wrote the book of five rings, which is all about um, being able to use various tools and understand one to a point, point of excellence, excellence where you can do everything else. Right. right. He, he also, also was, was the, he also played a significant role in founding this school of using two swords, right? right. So, so, so historically, oh, samurai have a longer sword, yes. katana, and then there's a smaller one. Right. Uh, I think it's called a kanto. I could be wrong on that one. But he famously used two katanas, right? Which which gave him like a significant advantage, yes. right? Because you can just if do you a know lot with it, right? Yeah, totally, right? But he was also very adept at using all these other weapons. You know, and then he was also well read, he was philosophical, he was, you know, very disciplined. And so it's just like this fictional character. It's like, well, who would I want to be like? Oh, Musashi. Like this guy's like pursuing his goal right and and the world is bending to him. So it just it just really stuck out. Now obviously it's a thousand page book. Yes. When am I ever gonna read that again? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. But there is something about somebody who's an absolute trained weapon, but also has the intellect to back it up and has the discipline to know when to use it. Yeah, that and, kind of a character. And, and, and I'll wrap up season. kind of discussing this with a quote. It's like, there, there's this quote that it's better to be a warrior in a garden yes. than a gardener in a war. Oh, that's where that came right? from. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned that before. It, it's not from the book necessarily, but it emulates Same. that like warrior, philosopher, yes. um, you know, uh, mentor, whatever it is, right? So, yeah, that's why that book's fascinating. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'll yeah. check it out. Um, okay. 
I'll I'll lead with one. It's, okay, it's completely on the opposite spectrum. In that, <laughs> it's like the shortest. It doesn't even really classify as a book. It's actually an essay. And, but it was one of the first ones when I started thinking about these influential books. Somebody got me onto it. It's called As a Man Thinketh. By as, a man think it. It. as a man think it. As a man think it. It's, it's old school. This is I, I know what year it was. Yeah, yeah, I didn't look it up. Who's James, James Allen. Allen. James yeah. Allen. Yeah. So, so this is like one of these classic, um, and, and it's an, it's just an, like an essay that he wrote. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I don't know. It's maybe fifty or hundred pages. You could pretty much read it in an hour if you wanted to. I actually really listened to it a couple weeks ago when we started talking about this because I started reading through and it was actually one of these books that set me on a bit of a path of wanting to think more about the way I think. So basically, the the main kind of argument of the book is that if you really want to become the master of your life, that you have to first master your thoughts. Okay. And and it's a pretty and that's basically the the premise of this essay is that if you can kind of cultivate your thoughts like you cultivate a garden, right? Then, the th then what will grow out of that will be more positive thoughts. You'll have more. Um, you'll end up finding success because you're continually working towards these more positive thoughts. So, for example, like he basically makes the argument that like a man's character, like who you are, what you're made up of, is a collection of all your thoughts. And so being purposeful about the things you're thinking about becomes so important. Like really, he sort of talks about how um, comparing it to like the example of a garden, he kind of makes the argument that, you know, like if you plant good seeds, you know, you're gonna get good things out of that. And if you don't, Things are going to grow in that space, right? If you're not constantly, whether you like it or not, and it's going to be weeds that are going to grow in there. Like if, without being diligent, without being purposeful about the things you're planting in your garden, and without constantly weeding it, you can guarantee things are going to fill that space, right? It's a vacuum. It's going to fill up, but it's going to fill up with weeds. And good seeds are going to produce good thoughts and good outcomes and, and negative thoughts. If you're constantly dwelling on that, it's it's going to breed weeds it's going to breed those negative thoughts mm -hmm. so the idea is you know like if you want we get the choice of kind of creating our thoughts and it's not always like how you do that okay that's a whole other kind of topic is how do you control your your thoughts and you know not let them kind of get the yeah. best of you but the idea that if you control your thoughts then you're really controlling your conditions and you can help control your environment and ultimately kind of your destiny and your success in life by starting by becoming a master and being purposeful about the things that you spend your time thinking about and what are you filling your mind with. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes back to what we talked about before about who are you spending your time with? What are you reading? You know, if you're just trolling, you know, reading through Facebook or TikTok, whatever, watch videos, it's like, what are you filling your brain with? Mm -hmm. And is that what you want to kind of help you um, get where you want to go? Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those ones where, I mean, you can go on the library's website and you can borrow it, because it's, I think, in the public domain now. So there's tons of versions of it, right? You can find a PDF. Yeah, you can find a PDF online. You can go get, there's a thousand audiobooks, and you can crush it out in, you know, one drive. Yeah, because by, by all means, you know, find it where you can. A easy <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, but... And, and maybe it's not for everybody because it is kind of older school, but it is an easy listen. And, and truly, when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know what, that was one of those first ones that I somehow got introduced to. And it really made me start thinking about, wow, what am I mm -hmm. taking in mm -hmm. in terms of my thoughts and, and yeah. how am I managing that? And it's something that maybe I, have, I actually haven't thought about this book in a while, but it definitely set me on a bit of a path. Mm -hmm. So. I, I feel, feel like, like there's, there's a lot of overlap, overlap in those two because even yeah. with the story of Musashi, it's like it starts from the inside. Yeah, and I think and that's that, that seems that's exactly it, right? right? And, and it's, it's interesting, interesting, you know, a student, student came up to me some sometime last week and asked, like, "Hey, how do I disrupt like you know negative thoughts?" And right. you know, a simple, simple thing, thing I tell people, people and that I've learned is that well, why not ask it the opposite? Like, I'm gonna fail this test. Well, what if you pass? Right. Right. Yeah. What if you Oh, that girl's going to say no. Well, what if she says yes? Right. Or, ah, you know, I'm not going to get the job, but what if I do? So just 
almost just providing the opposite, but yes. totally, right? And weeds are always going to grow. There's always going to be negative. Yes. Right. But right. what are you filling your brain with? Right. And, right. and what are you doing to cultivate it? Yeah. You know, what are you doing? And so, yeah, it doesn't really talk a lot about what, you know, what those strategies are. You know, on that note for like almost a year in my life, I had a, I had a sheet of mantras, right, that I made up myself and to counter that exact thing of like, I want to be more in control of my thoughts and my the way I interpret reality and the outcomes I get from that. Right. And so having a mantra, because I would read it every morning, right? I'd wake up, I'd start my day. I had about 10 sayings, right? And a lot of it was oriented around gratitude, gratefulness. Yes. Um, the fact that they're like, hey, you're actually worthy, that you have value, right? And just reshifting that perspective, you know? And, and even a slight shift can produce tremendous results. Absolutely. Exactly. I did the same thing. I had um, uh, kind of some mantras or, or things to, same, Same thing, thing. You, you kind of recite, recite yourself, yourself every, every day. day. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 there's it's research, research proving the validity of that and the value of, of doing those right. things yeah. where, you know what, what if you flood, flood, you're just flooding your, your brain with yeah. those thoughts. thoughts. And whether, whether you believe, believe them at the time or not, there's a lot of research that goes to show that, you know what, it's, they're good seeds. Mm -hmm. You're planting good seeds. Mm -hmm. how, good. Old, how old were you when you got a hold of them? Honestly, I bet I was 18 or 20. Okay. I was young. So like, kind of what it was. And, and that would have been like start of your Relative. university Yeah, career. exactly. Like first, I was in university. First two years of engineering can be yeah, brutal. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so just being aware of that, I don't always do the best job of it, but being aware of it is definitely something that's always there. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, I thought that's why I started with that one. I think I, think I was, was probably 23, 23 when I read this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, let's go on to the next, next book. book. We're at 2145. Uh, let's, let's see. see. So, so my, my next, next one, and honestly, this is like really up there. I, I haven't really read it again, but this book is called Mate. It's by Tucker Max and Geoffrey Miller. So Tucker Max is more of an entrepreneur, party boy, but Geoffrey Miller is more of a PhD evolutionary psychologist. And so this book is just kind of like a guideline on how to improve your dating life. And as funny as that might seem like to read something on that, but it's like, hey, listen, like if you haven't been on a date, you know, or, or if you don't understand why women keep saying no or right. things aren't working out, like, okay, we'll start learning. Absolutely. Start doing something different. But some, some of the, the big takeaways for me was that this book provides a female perspective and view on much of dating. So particularly like being approached. Like it never occurred to me that women might be scared of being approached by men, right? And, and just, yeah. just various differences. You know, and they highlight like, what do women fear the most? Um, you know, sexual violence. What do men fear the most? Rejection. And it's like, so those, those are, are two true. very different things, right? Like if wow, I approach a girl, yeah. you know, like, right. like truthfully, and I, I don't know how much we should discuss this, but like, you know, as a man, when you approach a woman, they're not worried about being kidnapped and raped no. right, or drugged, right? Whereas they do emphasize like, hey, that is a legitimate concern for women. Right. Never crossed my mind. Yeah. But yeah, I, I knew I damn well, well like, like, ooh, what if she says no? And what if it's very public? Of course, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Right? So that's, 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 that's the fear for men, mind. right? Um, you know, what they're looking for and why. So what is attractive to women on a, on a more physical, tangible level and then on an internal, like traits level, right? So physical, obviously being in better shape, right? Being well-groomed, taking care of yourself. Um, on the internal, it's like, well, they want men who are confident and generous, right? But also have this threshold of, you know, if you're just generous with everyone, it's like, well, you know, you got to have have some for yourself as well yes, and so exactly. emphasizing those traits how how women evaluate you know a man like you know there's a whole science behind that there's That's all this research done on how that. women evaluate men and, and you know the idea that a woman can essentially in a few seconds determine whether or not it's a yes or no yeah right? whereas men like for sure in some regards we can do that but over time these things can change but yes um some other stuff here so the book also has a a portion of it where it assists you in creating goals and a step-by-step -step plan for how you will improve the major areas of your life that lead to attraction, right? So it's also challenging you to then take steps. It has both a humorous locker room way of writing, you know, with Tucker Max's perspective, but it's mixed in with Joffrey Miller's PhD level of knowledge and background of the topic of human mating. So Joffrey Miller's written a couple other books that are a lot more like scientific, Yes. but this is probably one of his better just 
again, back, back, coming back, back to that back relatability. I was going to say, right? exactly. Because you're I, coming at it from more of a... You know, I, I got this book maybe when I was 18, when I was like 19, 20. Yeah. And so just seeing it from that perspective, right? Um, and one of the big things I like is that they both dedicate it and aim it towards helping young people have better success at pursuing and being in relationships, right? So they do discuss a little bit of what to do when you're in a relationship, not as much. But that, that one was definitely one of those pivotal books that just helps you figure out like, okay, I got to have my health, you know, my finances and my career, the kind of career stuff and, and also my internal game as well, right? Like right. If you're coming, like come kind of back to your essay, if you're coming into this situation with this mindset that you're not enough, yeah. that you're inadequate right. and, and woe is me, how will women pick up on that? How does that move through right. your, your body language? Yeah. And, and you know, if you just, kind of shrivel up and, and approach dating that way. It's like, well, why would she want you, right? right. Like, like <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but really, I mean, cause right. that's the reality is, you know, whether you like it or not, you are kind of being judged, you know, and, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 absolutely. it's an evaluation, absolutely. right? Absolutely, and, and somebody's making a judgment call on you based on all the, everything you're putting out there and some mm -hmm. of it's physical and some of it's not. So yeah, that's cool to actually look at some of the research and the, you know, what, yeah, what are what are those things? That and, and at the back of the book, the they list. have the citations, like all these references, yeah. right? And I would assume that's a lot of Miller's side of the sure. work, right? Yeah, but, but yeah. Um, again, none of these books are any specific order, but I would say this book really stands out. Like, if you want a really good idea of how to improve your dating life, how to be more attractive to women, what women are looking for, totally, I would read that book. Nice. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll see your book here. Uh, okay, so. This was one that I actually talked about a little bit last time. So this was Atomic Habits by James Clear, but I had to include it because it was, I mean, it's so popular. It's like a number one bestseller or whatever. But even still, if you haven't read it, I would really recommend it. It's a super easy read in as far as, but it's got so much packed into it. So it's really about trying, it's all about habit building, but the approach, I've read a lot of books on building habits because to me it's, pretty foundational to everything that comes after. after. You know, you know it doesn't matter, matter what you want to do. do. Mm -hmm. You want to get in better shape. You want to improve your like relationships. You want to be better at your job. You want to, whatever it is, it really comes down to the habits mm -hmm. that you're using to, to get there. Mm -hmm. And I've read a few, a lot of them, and, and a lot of them are, some of the books I've read were kind of feel a little pie in the sky and kind of hard to actually make actionable. So, so this, this book kind of breaks it down into like a two-step process. Ultimately, it's, it's about figuring out who you want to be and then what are the really small actionable steps you can take to get there. So it's really, it comes down to, first of all, like you gotta decide what kind of person you want to be. But the big idea is to, don't focus on who you want to be right now. Focus on who you want to be in 10 years. Yeah. yeah. What, do what do you want, want your physical, physical health to look like in 10 years? Yeah. Right? What, what do you, you want, want your, your like career, career and you might not you don't know what you know your career is gonna look like in 10 years, but what do you want your relationships to look like in 10 years? You know, like if you and then work towards that goal because it provides a little space for for that growth that doesn't happen overnight. And you know, there's examples where um, he refers to this. I don't know if I get the term right, latent potential, potential plateau, plateau of latent potential, I think he calls it, which is this, this idea, idea that sometimes, sometimes you know, you put in the work, it feels like, and every day, go to the gym, putting in the work, and you're, and you're not seeing the gains, and that's so hard to keep coming back to, and whether it's working out, or you're writing a book, or whatever, you, whatever it is you're doing, and you just, you don't see the gains, but he talks about this plateau of latent potential where, like, like that energy is not lost, you know, it's, it's like bamboo, you know, that takes, how long does bamboo, um, it takes a while, it takes like once years, it, starts growing. it takes years yeah. of absorbing all the nutrients and building that potential. And then within, yeah, days it's, it just shoots up, but it sits for years dormant. You think it was dead. You think nothing's going in, but all that energy is being stored. You know what I mean? So that idea of how do you get yourself to show up? every day to do the thing when you're not seeing the gains mm -hmm. that's really what this book is about and it's all about like it's super actionable mm -hmm. it's very focused on okay 
here's whatever it is for you, and he has tons of really practical examples that are the things you're probably thinking about or the things that you want to improve. And then making those really small gains. And I, you know, I think I gave some examples on the last one, but things like you want to start running, great. Tomorrow, just put your shoes on. Or yeah, like if you want to run a marathon. You, yeah, you want to run a marathon tomorrow. tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. Just put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. That's it. Great. You put right. your shoes on. That's just do yeah. that for a week. And do that for a week. And then the next week, you know, he makes the example. Okay, then you or you want to start going to the gym this week. Just, just go, go to the gym, gym four times. Don't work out. You don't have to exercise. Just just, just go, go there. there. And then you go home mm-hmm. if you want. But, but like, like that's, that's the goal. Okay, well, that's a pretty attainable. It feels it's measurable and it's attainable. But you're showing up, and that's. You know, that's the difference between beating yourself up because you didn't even start or, hey, you're the kind of, you're, it's the making, convincing yourself that you're the type of person that shows up. You're the type of person that is willing to show up and put your boot and shoes on. Yeah. Because last, yesterday, you might have been the type of person that, you know, just said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to forget it today. And that's, that's just the kind of person I am. You know, I just don't have the resolve. Versus, no, I'm the kind of person that at least I'm going to take action. And right. that, now if you can, the next day, okay, now you put your shoes on and you lace them up. Okay, now you have a 1% improvement. And every day you improve by 1%. You know, that growth is over the course of 10 years will help get you that goal that you wanted. So anyways, that's why I really like the kind of the idea of that book. And, and I tied it in with some other books and really... That was one where I really made kind of like a study out of it and really yeah. tried to like, what are the goals I want and how can I really apply these things? So I made a real study out of it. And just like your previous book, good habits and bad habits are competing. Right. Right. All the time. Like I'm always struggling with, so so kind of the first month and a half, two months of this year, I was waking up, I'd go stand outside in the cold, I'd do a quick five, 10 minute workout, just move my body, move some weights. Yes. But now it's like, well, I'm back to like just scrolling on my phone, I know. just looking at my phone, yeah. right? And Guilty. at least now there's that conversation of, hey, who do you want to be? Right. Right, and that's what really what it comes down to, like, who do you want to be? Right, and what are you gonna do tomorrow mm-hmm. that's a little different, like. And, and you know, it might be for me tomorrow, it's like, okay, can you just get out of bed? Yeah. Sit up Absolutely. and scroll on your phone, right? Absolutely. Like you can't go back to exercise in the morning. Just yes. scroll on your phone while sitting up. Sure. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, let's go, go to, to book three. We're at 3217. So my third book here, actually, and for those of you in my class, I actually have a poster of the book. So, oh, no, 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 never mind. That's my fourth one that I wrote. Uh, the third one is also related to a little bit, not necessarily dating, but on that masculine, feminine kind of energy. It's called yeah. The, the Way, Way of the, the Superior Man by David Data. So this book provides a very spiritual and esoteric view on masculine and feminine energy. It has a spiritual and honest explanations of what the two are and their role and how they interact, the interplay and interaction between the feminine and masculine and how to both be in the masculine and attract the feminine and explanations for feminine behavior and how the masculine should respond. So it's almost like a guideline of like, how, how can you deal with a woman as a man? Which may sound horrible, right? But no, but that's the reality you live in. Yeah, so, like I, I am a man, you're a man. Exactly. And I want well. to, you know, like I want to have a wife yeah. and a partner. And right. how do you deal with, you know, one of the chapters that's coming to my mind, it's really sticking out. It's like, the criticism is not in her words, right? It's so, so in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm butchering that. But what he's saying is like, don't listen to the specifics of what she's saying. Yeah. Like she might be nagging you about a particular thing. Right. What she's really nagging you about is the core of who you are. It's like, hey, like like you mentioned about the habits. Hey, you're not showing up right. for your half of this or your 100% of this relationship. Right. Like yeah. you're 50% into this relationship. Yeah. I'm 100% in. Right. We need to be at 200% because there's two of us. Yeah. So, so she, she might, might, you know, tell you like, like you know, so, so let's say there's a mess on the floor right now. It's like, yeah. It's like, hey, David, you know, you haven't cleaned the mess again. It's like, ah, you're just nagging me, right? right? No, no, no. It's about you're likely doing that in several areas of your life, right? She's poking you about, hey, you're not being the man you could be. Yes. You know, that's one of the things that sticks out. Also, just, you know, if your partner, if, if, if she is in a particular mood and say, how do you get her back into her feminine energy? And what is that even, right? Like, what should that look like? And, you know, people are welcome to disagree with this, with this interpretation, but... 
you know, particularly when you have a feminine woman, they go through the world in a very different way than a man might. Yeah. And they experience things very differently, right? So they might be a little bit more like head in the sky, things are good and loving. And it's like, that's excellent because I'm not that way. And I need that balance. Like, okay, maybe I don't have to be, you know, complete ass behind the wheel while I'm driving. We can maybe just be chill, right? While I'm walking. And, you know, there's necessity for the masculine to also then still be present. Yeah, and that's, and that's kind, kind of what he emphasized. Like the masculine's role is to be present. Like it's presence, right? right. And, and it's direction, direction as well, right? So, right? so it's very right. like it was a very spiritual take on these two things. It's not like okay, masculine, you go to work; feminine, you go to the kitchen and cook and clean, right? right? It's more like hey, these are two energies. Yeah. How do you balance them in yourself, and how do you promote one in the other? Yeah. Right? Like how do you get your partner? She's in her masculine, having to make choices and yes. lead the family. How do you then like put that back into balance? Because does she want to be in that energy? Right. Maybe not, right? And people vary, right? Like some men are more feminine than other men and some women are more masculine than other women. And you know, if that's the case, like let's say you're a more feminine man, like, okay, well, if you find a feminine girl, it's like, it's like there's not gonna be a natural polarity in that, in that relationship. Right. Right. Whereas let's say you're super masculine and she's also kind of masculine. Well, yes. You want to lead, she wants to lead. It's like, you know, you're going to butt heads a lot of like, no, we're doing this, we're doing that. Right. And so how do you, like, how do you in your own actions and your own energy guide people back towards that balance? How do you maintain that balance? And how important is that? Because that's one of those ones where, you know, when it comes to relationships, I had one relationship book that I don't think made it on here. might have been in my top three, I think. But, you know, you spend, you know, you find yourself in a relationship and, and you're going to spend the rest of your life with, with that, that person. person and you're spending you know, your, your life, life in relationships whether it's a romantic relationship or just relationship with people that you're spending time with how important to understand you know the differences in those energies and the difference in those energies in yourself and and how you do maintain that balance because like you say mm-hmm. if it is out of balance okay it can come across like just bickering and it can right? come across like nagging but that's not really what it is you know and it's like how do you make a man feel better it's like, well, you provide solutions, you help him, right. he starts working, he feels better about himself. Yeah. Right? But it, you know, you're married. Yeah. When your wife is having a problem, you just present solutions. Yeah. It never works. It doesn't work. No. Right? And no, so, and it, so and half what, the time it's about trying to figure out what is the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, you just want to talk about and figure out what the problem is. It took me a long time to. Yeah, and I still, I, I learned that lesson all the time. One of the things he mentions, it's like, no, no, no. Like, if she's feeling down about herself and she has a problem in her life, like, praise her. Right. Remind her of who she is. Right. Right? Because she, you know, she's very smart and capable, yeah. if you're assuming you picked a smart yeah. partner. <laughs> and they did. She can figure her partner, <laughs> she can figure her life out for yeah. herself. And there might be a time, but the masculine tendency to always be like, okay, here's the problem, Absolutely. here are solutions, like, this is how we can do it. She's irritated now. It, you end the problem because right. it's like, hey, you're not understanding as a man that, no, no, no. Like maybe, maybe she just she needs to be loved in that moment, right? right. So, Absolutely. so, so I, I found that, that book, book to be very valuable, and it and it, it's it's, it's kind of like, like my Bible in terms of masculine and feminine relationships. Yes. You know, I, I've skimmed through many of the chapters, I've read them over, and you know, take a bit of time in between reading the book, and you come back with new experiences right. and new perspective. But you come back to that same core of like, okay, where like where did this go wrong? Where did it go well? That's a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll hear, hear from you now. now. Okay, so, so this one's also kind of spiritual. So this one is, uh, this one's called the Book of Joy. Okay. And it's by, so it was, it's based on this seven day conversation between the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, okay. who is uh, formerly a South African Archbishop. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so they, the two, these two leaders, these two religious and world leaders met for seven days to have this conversation about the question, how do you find joy in life amidst sorrow and hardship and anxiety and strife and like, because there's a lot of that. So how do you find joy amongst that? And they had this meeting for seven days and it was documented uh, by the author and it was... There was a few really interesting things that I kind of took out of it that I kind of carry with me still. They they talk about, I mean, like, ultimately, there's no life without 
suffering without, without strength, strength without, without hardship, hardship without anxiety. Yeah. So, so what are you going to do? do? But like, but the point being that you can control your response to that, and ultimately that usually. Like the fear and the frustration and the things that you're that you're feeling because of those those hardships, like those are for the most part in your mind. Like those things are things that in a lot of cases you're creating for yourself. You see their suffering, and and that's not to like diminish people's suffering because it's, it feels very real for sure. And, and, and they, they talk about some very real examples. The higher you up are on compassion, the more you, the feel, more you feel those things. Yeah. But to realize that those things aren't necessarily like the reality, those are it's the way you're feeling about them. That's the way that. So, how do we handle, how do we deal with those emotions and how do you feel with them? And still, when you've got, because sometimes it feels when it, like it rains, it pours, you know, you've got all these things that are just like kind of layering up, you know, and. And it doesn't have to be this like world suffering. It can be, you know, like your car isn't working and you know you got like trouble in your relationship and then somebody something happens at work and you just feel like you just get like hammered down. Yeah, another bill comes, whatever, whatever it is. And it's just like so how do you find joy even amidst all of that? And so they talk about a couple um, a couple of examples, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting out of that book was they talked, talked about how, how so, so I'll, I'll kind of read a bit of a quote from it. They said, we have to think really seriously about this problem because just to pray or even just to rely, rely on religious faith isn't enough. And they talk about how, you know, there's seven billion human beings. It's not, religion is not enough because it's not universal enough. And so their point was, and this was um, Archbishop Tutu, I think, that made the comment like, we have to rely on education because education is universal. Like that learning is universal. And so how important is it that we teach people and teach youth sort of the source of happiness and satisfaction? How do you find that happiness and satisfaction in life amidst all these things that are sort of happening to you? And so like there were, you know, there's lots of examples about trying to become a spreader. Like, when you're feeling, you know, like you're finding it hard to find that joy, trying to become a spreader of love and kindness and putting it back out there, not not so that it comes back, it does, you know, it does end up coming back, but it's focusing less on me and more on trying to spread joy to everybody else, you know, is kind of the way out of that. And they talk about lots of examples and it goes into great depth, but... For me, the reason that I found this especially influential is because, you know, this was kind of the point where I was thinking about going into teaching and then, and I've read lots of books on, you know, happiness and like finding joy and whatever. And, and this was one that just took a little bit different look at it because it was very much about, it's not about you. It's not really about your thoughts. And when you, you know, you've got to look outside yourself. You've got to go find those ways to try and spread that love and joy and kindness. And then, and then let, let it come, come back. back. But I thought the education part was really interesting where, you know, these are two religious leaders in our world that are saying, you know what, it's not enough. Religion isn't going to do it because it's not universal enough. It's got to be through education. It's got to be through helping or helping young people find out how to be happy because it's, it's tough, you know, like for young people. There's, a, there's just so much being put on them and so much anxiety and the, and the expectations in the schooling. It's crazy. It's crazy. I feel like it's well, more than and what those, I was. And, you know, those are simple problems. Yes. Right? Like, so I have my current event project and the amount of people who come back with something related to climate change. It's like, hey, kids, like, please, like, please like, do, do more research because, yes, it's a challenging problem, but... It's, it's not, not like it's, it's not, not a problem we can't solve and right? work around. You know, you know, they're, 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 and, and I don't, I don't know, know what your experience is with, with the information, but I'm always trying to find alternatives. Yeah, right. Which right. People, people might be like, oh, Kawaja, you're a climate change denier. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. And someone called me that recently. You know, she's like, oh, are you someone who denies climate change? I'm like, no, I deny the apocalyptic vision of it. Like, mm. I have a friend, this guy is probably a genius. You know, you know he, he, he's, he's doing, doing nothing, nothing with his life, more or less. If you're ever watching it, <laughs> he's doing nothing with his life, more or less. But you know, it's like, ah, oh, well, you know, 
climate change will just like kill half the people on the earth. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, what? <laughs> Three point, like, like where did you pull that number out yeah. of? Like, which, which, which estimation says that, right? Yeah. If, if, you know, and, and if it was, was so bad, bad why did Obama, Obama buy a beach house? house? You know, it's their party that's saying, saying like, oh, well, you know, you should uh, make sacrifices. Yeah. And you're and buying a beach house? house. Yeah. Doesn't, Doesn't seem to suggest the ocean levels are rising rapidly. rapidly. Yeah, and, and, and even on that, that, some student had a, a project saying, like, oh, the ocean levels are rising. Or maybe it was the girl who I was chatting with. And it's like, you don't understand. It's rising at like two centimeters a decade. Something, something, it's something really slow, like... Okay, well, you know, we can maybe work around that. Like the Netherlands, from what I've heard, is below sea level. You know, so they have methods and ways of dealing with this stuff. You know, the Romans had ways of moving water, and they didn't have excavators and, and, and machinery. And so some of the problems that are being dumped onto their heads is, it's like, hey, buddy, why don't you worry about getting your homework done instead? Like that's a, that's a big problem for you. Because yeah. your, your grades, grades are trash. <laughs> yeah, and that's you not to say know, climate change isn't a problem. And, and you don't know how to read and write and express yourself. Yeah. You, you ain't going to be on that climate change <laughs> solution. I, that's right? it. I think mean, that's the point. And then, you know, you could base that idea of education back on, well, what's the solution to climate change? Education. Like, hey, how about let's make better choices? Right. Right. And, and you know. How about, How about we, we get, get people, people to voluntarily make better choices and experiment? Yeah. So, so I don't, I don't mind, mind when, when this friend of mine pushes me on like, oh, are you climate change diet? Because, because you know, she, she went zero, zero waste for some time in her life and realized, mm-hmm. oh, it's difficult. Right. Well, cool. cool. You, you have credibility, credibility then. then. Right. Yeah. Like, like you know, this, this idea, idea that we're all going to drive electric, electric cars. cars. You know, I, I saw, saw Tesla, Tesla on the road the other day. His license plate was coal power. It's like, thank you. Someone who understands hey, where that energy is coming Yeah, from, absolutely. Right? And uh, I saw, and I think it was a guy, it was like a middle-aged guy. And then I saw a Tesla uh, two weeks later, you know, elderly woman, uh, no more gas. It's like, all right, lady, you're living in La La Land. Like, you don't know where electricity comes from. Like, we didn't tie up Thor somewhere and just have him, like, shooting electricity. Yeah, exactly, into the, into the grid. You know, electricity is produced by... Uh, Fossil fuels. Right and, now, yeah. And in America in particular, I was watching this documentary, a lot of those charging stations are from coal power power right. lines. Yeah, where you so, from. Yeah, how do you find joy in the midst of struggle, right? Like when your life is miserable, you know, when, when you're up late studying, yes. working hard, whatever it is, how do you find joy? Right? How do you recognize that, oh, these are the good years? Like, yeah. Because, like, you know, you know one, one day all these problems will be solved and you'll go, well, sit around with your hands empty. You go, well, what do I do now? Yeah. Which I think a lot of teachers, you know, I mean, why is there so many teachers that come back and, and, and stay involved after retirement? Right. It's like, what do I do now? I've done this for 20, 30 years. Like, what do I do now? Right. And, and that transition isn't so graceful for many people. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, like, well, how, how do you, you find, find joy, joy in those little things? things? I, I think, think so. so. Right. How, how, how do you build, build more, more than just your career as well? Yes. Right? And, and your family. Like, that's right. Outside. Yes, because eventually yes, that career is probably not going to be there. So. Yeah. We'll, move we'll move on to the on. fourth yeah. book. Uh, we are at 40. We'll just go 48. Oops. My writing is terrible. So, so my, my fourth, fourth book, book now, now, this one, one, there's a poster. So, And I know we chatted about this book. So 12 Rules for Life by Jordan P. Peterson, yes. which... Yep. My God, do educators hate this guy? Like, uh, I, I mentioned him at one of the central office meetings, and I mentioned him and John Bajot, whose painting yes. I have up there. And, you know, that didn't make it into the notes. No. Which is, which is sad. It's like, you know, when they're asking for what are resources to learn more about the Bible, it's like, hey, Jordan Peterson has this whole series, like psychological connections to these stories. And John Bajot has done all this work on the symbolism and what these stories mean and how they relate to life. Like, as a Muslim, I can tell people so much about the Bible, and none of that got added. So, you know, and, and I will address the controversy. I think people don't like, there's a lot of things to not like about the guy, but I think a lot of people took a hard stance when he went against Bill C-13, whatever it was, the... You know, basically, there's a law in Canadian government that says that you have to address people by their pronouns, which puts our district in such a dicey situation now, right? Like, and fortunately, we don't really deal with people um, maliciously coming up to us like, oh, you better call me XYZ pronoun. And if you don't, like, I'm going to have your head in a bag later. So, you know, when he stood up against compelled speech, a lot of people were very divided on that. 
And anyways, anyways so, so ignoring the controversy, controversy, let's focus on the positive. So his book, 12 Rules for Life, is, is essentially a guide for, you know, how to improve yourself. Right. There, there's a couple of simple things and, and there's a lot of psychological interpretation, a lot of both biblical story involved and, and just hero journey story involved. But one, I mean, I could go through several of the rules I went through them. I didn't add them. But rule five in particular, actually, it's not four. It's rule five. Um, why you should set and maintain boundaries with children. You know, he, he, so the rule states, do not let your children do things that makes you dislike them. I just watched that. I just watched the podcast where you talked about that. Yeah. And my God, if you are not willing to look at that with both eyes open, you're not acknowledging the reality that when people do things to you that you don't like, you would treat them poorly. And you may not treat that individual poorly, but you will treat someone poorly. Yeah. And so really reflecting on... Like, like, and you know, people, you know, some, some people are very agreeable and they can't do this. They can't set a boundary. But the thing is, it's like, well, you're going to get upset at some point and you might snap. Yeah. Right? But you know, when you have children and they're always going to be around, it's like, you want to like your child. Cause if you don't, and you don't have the, their best interests in your mind. Yes. My God, you're harming this person. Yeah. And, and they're, they're innocent, innocent, right? They're, they're helpless. Really? Like a child is helpless compared to a grown person, you know? Another one, the importance of cleaning your room and maintaining a degree of order in your own household. So, hey, you know, there's problems in the world. Fix your own life first. Right. Start there. Like, like you're make a mess. Your bed. That's a good story. <laughs> you're a mess. Right? Yeah. Like, make your bed, clean yeah. your room, keep that tidy right. consistently, get rid of the old stuff that's lurking in the corner of your closet, yeah. in the corners, whatever. Like, like, you know, clean the dust bunnies. Like, I, I got to yes. do that too, for the record, right? Like, um, but how important that is to just, can you even maintain your own household? Because if you can't maintain your own household, who the hell are you to say that, oh, well, if I, if I was in charge, sure. things would be different. It's like, right. well, you can't clean your own room right. or your kitchen or your house. How are you going to clean up these huge problems? And with that rule five combined, it's like, well, your children hate you and your house is a mess. Who the hell are you to lead anyone or anything? Like, right. you clearly failed. You know, I was talking about this in my social 30, that there, there was this... It, historically, you know, people who owned property were allowed to vote. And you might look at that as, oh, well, that was rich people. But owning and maintaining property suggests that you can actually care for something. Right. And maybe, and maybe that, that says, says a lot about whether or not you can vote. Yeah. And I don't know. Should everyone over the age of 18 be allowed to vote? I don't know. Yeah. Should there be a limitation on, well, you're likely going to die in yeah. the next five to 10 years due to just your age? You ain't going to be around. Like, why should your decisions affect the policies of people who are 15, 10? So, so interesting. Very, very <laughs> interesting. Very uh, controversial yeah. point there. But uh, another one, pursuing what is meaningful rather than what is expedient. It's like, you know, man, work is hard. Yeah. I, I told my kids again, like, earlier this week, my social 30s. And I'm proud of myself. I'm remaking my first unit's notes and they're much better, much more straightforward to the point, easy to understand. I hope I'll, I'll run it with my class, but that's meaningful. It's like, hey, I'm providing clear, concise education. Right. I'm not just using what was given to me and saying, ah, well, you need to do better. That's good enough, yeah. Because honestly, like there were kids in my previous year that, that did just fine on their essay assignments. This year they're struggling. It's like, well, I could, I could say, say well, well, to hell with the students. students. My last, last year's class did fine. This, this, this next, next one, maybe the next crew, kids, kids coming in that social, social 30 might, might not be very strong students either, either but, but how do I make a more meaningful presentation right. in, in my, my life, life, not just my work, right. in my life? Right. Um, what can you do? Not so much, not just what Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I can't just, because, you know, my first year, my first quarter of teaching, I realized, okay, I know how to write, but I don't know how to teach it. Right. So I can just tell them, oh, you're in grade 12, you should know how to write. Yeah. But then you're just an idiot. Right. Right? Yeah. You know? It's true. Tell the truth or at least don't lie. Man, telling the truth will take you on an adventure. And I was just having a discussion with my friend on this, like, how how much truth is too much? Right? How do you manage that? And I think it only comes from experience. You have to make mistakes of being too honest. But where does lying get you? Yeah. Nowhere that I think you want to be. Nowhere that I want to be. Yeah. Right? I could lie. I could deceive. I could, you know, and lying is exhausting. So, so, so the same friend, she asked me, she's like, 
like, how do you know I've been truthful? Like, how do you know I'm not telling you a lie right now? Yes. And, and I thought about that because that's a really good question. Like, how do you know someone's lying to you? And the biggest thing I could think of is, well, is their story inconsistent? Right. Inconsistency. Absolutely. Right. And so when you chat with someone and stories line up and facts line up and details. Now, obviously, you might say, I don't really fully remember when this happened. That's different. Yeah. But if it's like, hey, on Monday I did this. And a week later, I tell you, yeah, well, though, I was doing this. Yeah. Okay, there's inconsistencies. It's yeah. not lining up, right? There's a, there's a nice quote from a God of War game. It's like, you know, this character, he's a smith. You know, he says, ah, all the parts aren't welding true. Like, all these right. things aren't fitting together. That's a pretty good sign right? that, yes, so, something's not quite right. You know, and then when it comes down to, like, at an institutional level, you know, like, when kids irritate me, I do tell them. And that may be not the most professional thing, but I'm not going to pretend, like, I'm okay, I'm okay with certain with behavior. Yeah. Like, hey, hey stop, stop doing, doing that. that. Why? Because it's, it's irritating. irritating. And, then and then I'll, I'll tell them, like, hey, you might have had bad experiences with teachers in the past because they, they, you irritated them. Right. And, and they, they just, just didn't tell you. They just, they just punished you. Yeah. I'm not going to punish you. I'm not going to kick you out of my class. But I will tell you in front of everyone, like, you're just doing something that's irritating. And you don't need to be doing it. Yeah. Right, and, and and some, some people, people might think, think that's, that's wrong, but yeah, like but to, to me, understand why? To me, that's true empathy. It's like this person needs to know. Like, and if you, you want, want them to be better, better, you know, you want to help them be better. Yeah, and on the flip side, I've given the person positive feedback right. of like, hey, like I gave you some advice on how to clean up your writing. You took it. Look how good your writing is. Like this is very legible, you know. So so making sure that that is done both ways. Another one, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not who to who someone else is today. Yeah. You know, it's like comparison is the thief of joy, right? Or whatever that saying is. And so how, like, yes. if you're always looking around outside, like, oh, that person has this, this person has that, like, I have a little bit more, oh, they're getting a little too close to me, I need to do more. Yeah. You'll never experience joy, but if you, and I really like how yours are building, I'll, I'll comment on that later, but if you just take a moment to reflect like if I look at myself from when I was 21 to now 26 or 22 going 27, whatever, five years ago, I mean, I've, I've accomplished so much. And it may not always show tangibly like, okay, maybe I don't have nearly as much money in the bank as I'd like or nearly like, you know, I mean, there was a part of me when I was 18, 20, it was like, oh, like by 27, like I'll have my first kid. I'll be married at 25. Right. Sure. On those metrics. But Again, it comes down to like, I, I understand much better how to evaluate a person for a partnership. Right. And although there's no partnership at the moment, let's say, at least there's no misery, yeah. right? Like at yeah. least there's no Absolutely. suffering. And so hey, in comparison, like to who I was you know, yesterday, yeah. it's like, oh man, so much growth has happened. Like, so much to be grateful for. Yeah, and, and so much kind of point to so much to look forward to. I don't know if you recall, we had a PD early on in the year, like one of our first ones, and they showed a graph where it's like people in our age category are the are like at their lowest. Yes, I know exactly. What you're talking about. And I went home and I talked to my buddy about that, and I was like, I don't like that graph. Like I feel like I'm having a good old jolly time. I feel like I've just been going up and up. And then, you know, he, he pulled me back. He reminded me, he's like, well, Najib, you got to understand most people, like they're not learning and growing. They're not right. trying new things. Right. And, and so, so their maybe experience. Maybe you settled into a career where you're feeling like you're kind of in a rut. And they're, and they're and they're like, well, 20 more years to retirement. Right. Like, this is the suck. Right. Whereas to me, it's like, no, no, no. Like, I don't know what this I'll do when it. I can't work. Yeah. Right. I like, know. like if I don't have a community, like how am I going to get by? That's going to suck. Yeah. Whereas, Whereas now, now, like I was telling the kids, obviously I was a little bit more moody the last two days, but today I was very happy, very jolly. I was like, yeah, I get to see you lovely kids every, every day, right? Totally. And, and then yeah, I told them the honesty. Like, yeah, you're not always lovely to see, but I'm sure I'm not either, right? Yeah, that's it. Like, so comparing yourself to who you were yesterday, but not to who someone else is today. Um, and and, and, and that's, the, 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 that's five rules out of maybe seven or eight I could have pulled that. Yes. When I look at that chart, it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's good. Like, it's so, you know, if you apply that into your life. I like, I like that, that rule of number 11, you know, when you see kids skateboarding, leave them alone. And, and the whole idea is like, hey, when you see young people pushing the limitations of what they think they're capable of doing, leave them alone. Don't just, and, you know, like sometimes I'll watch kids roughhouse and I'll just watch them a distance and I don't say anything. Right. And it just solves itself. There's like, obviously, kids don't get hurt. Not about fighting, but I know with my own kids. Absolutely. There's a point where, you know what, like to be purposeful about when, when you insert, insert yourself mm -hmm. into their problems and like lots of times you know my wife and I try to be pretty purposeful when the kids really kind of start like start bickering a little bit 
and, and, and rather than stepping in and trying, trying to fix it for them, them we'll just, just sort of like narrate, narrate what's happening. happening. Oh, oh wow, I can, can kind of see, see you know, like, oh, you, so and so, you seem really upset. upset. Or, oh, wow, it looks like you took his toy. Or, oh, wow, whatever. You're just like talking about just dictating what's happening. And it's funny how just saying it out loud, whatever it is that's going on, you know, it's kind of like it makes it more tangible for them and just. You know, you're not solving anybody's problem. I didn't I didn't provide any suggestions, I didn't have any ideas, but just it makes it more tangible for them and then all of a sudden they can see a new way to kind of solve their own problem. So whereas if you insert yourself and try and solve it for them, they don't get next that time, experience. They don't see that and then eventually they start like seeing what's happening themselves. And then they can make their own they make choices based on that, you know. You ever seen that image of like these three people and they're all looking at the same thing but from different angles? Yeah, yeah. It's like that. Like yeah, you're that third. Absolutely. You're providing that different perspective, yeah. right? Because in the heated moment, like a child might understand, like, yeah, you did take the toy. What are you doing? Yeah. Right? Why do you think your brother's upset and she like you took his toy? Exactly. Right? Why'd you take the toy? Yeah. Right. And maybe that's a chat for later, the why. Yeah, it, right, maybe right? once everybody calms down a little bit, but but in that moment, just giving them the room mm -hmm. to grow anyways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, so here we'll hear from your book now. Okay, I'm gonna actually so my one of the books I wanted to include was uh, The Alchemist. Again. Oh yeah. She's a classic. I know I know you read it because we talked about it a little bit before. But um, Paulo Coelho's uh, the Alchemist was for me. I mean, well, it's kind of that obviously that hero's journey story as well. And there's so much to be gotten from that book. I mean, I just I love it. Like I'll, I'll I listen to the audio book all the time. I'll listen to it once a year just because again it's quick. You can you know it's only like a four hour listen kind of thing. But it there's just so much in there. But the thing for me. So I guess for anybody that hasn't really read it. It's, it's get out from the rock you're living on. Yeah, under, number right? one, get out from the rock. <laughs> but number two, so it is about it's about this boy named Santiago, and he embarks on this journey, looking for this treasure um, in the pyramids. Well, he he's, he's advised by a king that yes, there's a he treasure a for him, yes, right? Exactly. There's a treasure waiting for him. Exactly. And so he's he goes on this journey to try and find his treasure, and has all these experiences along the way and I mean there's there's like I say there's so much to be gotten from that story but he the boy at one point early on he's a shepherd and it's kind of all he knows you know and, and he meets this king who tells him about this treasure and and so he's got to kind of make this choice and so he you know ends up selling his sheep which that's everything to him that's literally as a shepherd that's your life and so he sells off his sheep and goes on his journey and eventually he meets this crystal maker and helps in the shop and learns how to sell crystal. Oh, don't forget, before he meets the crystal merchant, and oh, maybe this is a spoiler, I shouldn't say. I don't know. Oh, he, so he goes on a journey and part of the hero's journey is that you're going to struggle. Yes. And so he's hustled. Yes. Well, we won't tell you what because you should read yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah. You, you just gotta, you just gotta read it. Yeah. He's, he's hustled. Yeah. Played like a fiddle right at, right at the beginning. Played just like a fiddle. Yeah. Right before he meets his crystal merchant. Yeah. 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 And it's so early on, and it's just so classic. And it's devastating. Yes. His journey because it's everything. Yeah. It sells everything. And mm -hmm. he's, exactly. And and he's got to overcome. You know, and obviously filled with these feelings of like inadequacy and you know failure and. And there's this one point, the reason I kind of mentioned those two things is because there's this quote in the book where he said, all of a sudden, after kind of having some of these experiences, he says, I felt tremendously happy. Because he said he came to the realization that he could always go back to being a shepherd. And he could always go back to being a crystal merchant. But he's got this chance right now to go and seek his treasure. And if he chooses not to, that opportunity is going to pass him by. And then it's going to be gone. And for me, I remember so clearly, I was listening to this book right at the point where I was like doing engineering in this career that I knew I kind of wanted to make a change, but it was just feeling like, you know, okay, I'm going to give up the next three years. I'm not going to have any income. And like, how am I actually going to make it work? And it just seems impossible. And like, really, it, it's just like, oh, forget it. And then, I don't know, I was listening to this, and he said that, you know, I can always go back to being a crystal merchant. I can always go back to being a shepherd. I'm like, actually, I can always go back to being an engineer. You know what? This whole thing doesn't work out. 
I got a degree. I can always go back and do that. Mm -hmm. I can get another job probably, you know, know, without without too too much much trouble. trouble. I know know a lot lot of people. people. Mm -hmm. I can always always do that that again. again. Mm -hmm. So what's really stopping me then? Like, what is it really that's preventing me from taking the next step? And it's kind of like, okay, well, then maybe I should really think about it because this is my chance. And as as much as there's these things that I know are going to be kind of difficult between here and there, if I don't do it right now, I probably won't do it in 10 years. No. Because you know, now I'm going to have so much more. 10 years of excuses. 10 years of more excuses not to do it. So it's kind of like, hey, Your you know what? Your kids are in junior high. Right. Your family's yeah, probably living in a different, different house, right. a different area. Busier You're and so and much busier with engineering. Right. I was thinking about this because you know, I'm having this struggle myself. And it's like, well, what stops us from going on that adventure? And, I, and part of it is you, know, you need to have a plan. Yes. But not going on the adventure also speaks a lot to your lack of preparation beforehand. Right. Like, you know, did, did you put, put away enough money? money? Right. Did, you did you learn, learn enough, enough about a variety of things? things? Did you did you did you make decisions in the past that suggested that you might do something differently in the future? Because right. you always made the same path of decisions, it tells a lot about what you're going to end up doing. How can you expect a different outcome? Another thing I'll add. And I'm speaking on your book. No, I please, apologize. please go ahead. No, no, but, it's worth speaking on. This book does such an excellent job. Paulo Coelho does such an excellent job of highlighting all these other individuals who are on different parts of the journey. So one thing you you should know about the guy who sells glass, the shop owner, is that he's stuck at the first step. Yeah. You know, because his vision is to go to Mecca. Yes, exactly. To go to the Holy Land, to do this migration. It's like his perfect opportunity showed up with this faithful, loyal young man who's also a damn good merchant. Yeah. It's like, buddy, if there's ever a time for you to leave the shop in the care of someone else yes, and be able to come it. back to it, because that's what he wanted to do, right? That, that was his chance. Like, and I think, I think the boy tells him, like, yeah. go to Mecca. Like, yes. what's stopping you? Yeah. Like, I'm here. I got the shop, and he's like, ah, you know, I gotta polish my glass. Right. I gotta do this. It's like, you know, people make themselves busy with yeah. redundant things. For sure, and we, we fill our lives with excess things that keep us busy, so that you know, maybe deep down, we can say. Ah, oh, well, you know, I, I can't pursue my dream. You know, I, I got the dog to take care of. I got, oh, I got jiu-jitsu on the weekend or like. Exactly. But you really like, you know, Jordan Peterson was talking. I was listening to this. It's like, if you're going to take that leap of faith, if you're going to do that, this thing that terrifies you. Yeah. Don't think you'll do it 10 years from now. Because 10 years from now, you'll be weaker. Yeah. The whatever was, whatever you were facing will have grown tremendously. Right. That fear will have grown. All the negative stuff, like just like back to your first book. Yeah. Those weeds will grow. All the yes. reasons to not do it will grow. And 10 years from now, you're a little bit weaker. You're a little bit more tied up with different things that you can't you just can't draw. Right. right? You know? Exactly. And the, the book, book does such, such an excellent job of highlighting these different individuals who are on their journey because he meets an alchemist. Yes, exactly. Who's in the process of trying to figure out how to turn like lots of lead, lead into gold, yeah. right? And this guy's also somewhere. He's in the he's in the realm of chaos where he doesn't really know what's going to happen or right. if he should continue that right. path, right? And and I, I don't remember the second half of the book. I haven't read the whole book in a while, but the first half I do. Remember. Yeah, I know it's been a while for me too, but. Yes, but here, exactly. I'll, I'll let you wrap up. No, no, I was just going to say that story for me, it was just such a, again, sometimes it's about reading the right story at the right time. And for me, that one was just happened to be right on the right time. And honestly, I think it's a good time for that book. So mm-hmm. that's a good okay, okay, we'll, we'll pause. pause. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're back from yesterday. Uh, book number five for myself is Man's Search for Meaning by Victor yeah. Frankl. I don't know if you've read this. Yes, book. several times. Oh, yeah, yeah it's really good. So this one kind of, the criteria was a bit different for this one. Now, obviously it's a very influential, impactful book. Does it really challenge one to do much? Not necessarily, right? I mean, yeah, challenges one to be aware and to actually look at the atrocity that happened. But yes. the reason for this book is, so two of my university classmates, and both these guys were older than me. So I would have been around 21, 22 at the time. One guy was maybe early 30s and one guy was early 40s. Yeah. And so two of them spoke very highly of it. And one of them was brought to tears in that moment. Like the lecture hall had emptied out. It was just the three of us chatting. Yeah. And he was very emotional, almost brought to tears, just recollecting, you know, particularly 
I think Maybe you should let the people know just for those that don't know what the book is about, like a topic of it. Because yes, okay. so Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. So Viktor Frankl is a German Jew who mm-hmm. was taken into a concentration camp during World War II. Yeah. Who in his book narrates, you know, first things first, they separated the women and children and the men. And the children were then separated. Like if you're too young to work, you were pretty much just incinerated. Most of the women were incinerated and the men were put to work. Yeah. And the men were then furthermore, and, and women, everyone was stripped of their valuable possessions. And there's a particular scene, I think I wrote it down. I don't know if it was Viktor Frankl or someone else, but he narrates that some guy noticed that a German Nazi prison guard was wearing his gold wedding ring. Right. Right. And he noticed that. So, you know, he, he, they're, they're stripped of their valuable possessions and then they're essentially put into, you know, sections and houses. They're crammed in like worse than livestock, worse than slaves probably as well. And, they are then made to do trivial, meaningless work to some extent. And yeah. other times they do certain things. And so yes. Victor Frankl's book is not like a sob story necessarily. He talks about how were some people able to survive mm-hmm. and how did people deal with that reality. Yeah. And what I will say before you read the book, he does state very explicitly, he says the best of us did not survive, which... You know, I don't know what to make of that statement, right? So, so anyways, my two friends were chatting about this. One was brought to tears when recalling images of Jews who survived death camps, right? And it was really horrible what happened to these people. The book itself, you know, Frankel goes on. He emphasizes the value of a rich internal life, what he calls it, Mm -hmm. and how that plays a role in surviving any degree of suffering one is put through. So he does often in the book narrate how... One, he had to continuously convince himself that his wife was still alive mm-hmm. because knowing that his wife and child were dead. I, th- I believe he had a child. I'm not 100% sure, but wife for sure. Yeah. Because giving into that despair would have caused him to lose his life. Right. And he he's not sure if she's alive or dead. So it's right. like if you give in to despair and die, like, well, what if she was alive? Right. That hope. Right. The hope. Hope plays a significant role in it. And then the additionally, you know, he he talks about how the work is so trivial at times that you have to keep yourself mentally busy. Right. And so some people did not have what he called the rich internal life where they couldn't pull themselves out of their situation and think about what they were doing, why they were doing it and how it was impacting them. Yes. And, and you know, sort of as an escape too. And by all means, like escape the concentration yeah. camp world, right? Like yes. slip away into your mind. But some people couldn't do that to the same extent. Um, there's a particular scene that fe- it's like burned into my memory. I feel like I was there and I witnessed this, but he mentions that he was working inside a house and he looks out the window and he sees this prisoner who is slowly working, doing whatever. I don't know, yeah. like digging manual. Like I think that, he was manual. Digging. Yeah, labor. I thought so. I thought he was digging. Yeah. And the, he says the man slowly puts his tool down, moves his hand to his pocket like rummages into his pocket, pulls out a piece of bread, you know, and it might be like a chunk of bread, right? Mm. Nothing significant. This ain't a loaf. Yeah, no, exactly. He says he witnesses the man gnaw on the bread, right? You know, at this point, they've been there for a year or so, two years, and many of these people are severely malnourished. They're physically depleted. You know, he probably couldn't even have chewed. He gnaws on the bread, he notices. And he chews at maybe about half of it. And then puts the rest back into his pocket because that was likely going to be his dinner. Yeah. And so this particular oh, wow. scene is just stuck in my head of like the, you know, and it's really hard to describe. Like, how do you get past that if you've been in that situation? Oh, you like, ever could. I know every, there are certain scenes from that book. Me as well, that just are like, like locked in my memory, certain things right? that he and, describes. And everything after that experience for them is like, you, you they must have asked themselves, like, am I actually alive? Like, did I die? Yeah. And just, I'm not aware of it. Another scene you know, he, he, he discusses is that um, nearing the end of the, the occupation and whatnot and, and the war, uh, and, and this is, I teach this in social 20 and 30, Hitler, rather than utilize these Nazis, these, these Jewish prisoners to assist in the war effort, I mean, he's just maximizing his carnage. And Peterson mm-hmm. talks about this too. It's like, well, 
Did Hitler right. want to win the war or did he want to kill Jews? Well, let's look at what he did. When it came down to winning or losing the war, they, the Nazis pushed through the, the final solution, which was like, let's just kill as many Jews as possible. Right. And so, if I recall correctly, Frankel does write about how um, he essentially has to switch out his position, his, his situation. He's, he's yeah. put on a train to be incinerated. Yeah. And he has to essentially make moves to make sure that someone else is sent. So he right. talks about what it was like to have yeah. to send someone else to their death and doom. And uh, we already discussed the, so seeing wedding jewelry on the hands of Nazi guards, yeah. like, oh, that guy has my wedding ring yes. and I can't do anything. You know, that guy has my shoes or belt, whatever it is, and you're just stuck. Yeah. Uh, additionally, dealing with capo, capos or capos, which mm -hmm. are Jewish prison guards. You know, they, yeah. they, they discuss like, well, the worst people there were not the Nazis. It was the Jews who decided to support that system and right. become guards and, and guard over yeah. Jewish people, you know. So um, takeaways from that, you know, what it takes to survive a harrowing situation, you know, and this book touched me deeply and personally. You know, so Frankel uses his words to paint such intense, tragic and powerful scenes that, and I must have read this book five, maybe six years ago now, but that yeah. scene of that man eating the bread, it, it feels like I was watching it. Yeah. You know, and really interesting, you know, uh, I try to teach students as much as I can about communism and Nazism and, and these extreme forms of society and yes. not in their ideal sense, like, well, this is what they were trying to do, but hey, this is what happened to the lowest common denominator. Right. And, and like you say, it's not a, it's a little different than some of the other accounts that I've read because, you know, it's not, it's not so much about his own suffering as much as it is like, what sort of separated, I mean, you see it and that firsthand account, it's, it is, it's so, so powerful, but like that distinction between what enabled some people to survive and those that didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've just found that really interesting. And right. Cause there's in our school, a lot of kids read night by yes. we, we sell, yep. by however you say his name. Yep. And I've never read that book, but yeah. One thing I forgot to mention is Victor Frankel was a, he was a psychologist. He, he was yeah. a, he, he was a therapist, psychologist, mixture of the two mm -hmm. before he went into the prison camp. So he was psychoanalyzing the situation while he was in it. Right. And, and trying to determine what was going on. Yeah. Which right. is pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. I will put the next one up for yours. Let's hear your fifth and sure. final book. Um, so I was kind of, I was between a couple because I like, and I'll mention the other ones. The, so the one of the books that I've always found kind of most impactful is Seven Habits for Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And I don't even know that I, I mean, it's, it's a great book and worth a read if, you know, you're kind of interested in that. But that wasn't even necessarily, it's not the whole book. There was maybe just a couple of ideas out of it that just really, that I found impactful, um, which is why I include it. The other one that I was between is, I don't know if you ever read The Five Love Languages. No. Oh, I'll mention it. So maybe, that was maybe. more of a relationship yeah. one. I'll mention it as kind of one of my others. But the reason I included Seven Habits is because I feel like it sort of captures... This is Stephen Covey. This is Stephen Covey, yeah. And it sort of captures like the essence of how you sort of align yourself with the principles that you have in your life. And so like... One of his, this, the book is really focused on, okay, interpersonal effectiveness. How do you engage with other people, relationships? Um, you know, he talks about things like relationship bank accounts and how, you know, like you can, how you pay into other people's relationship bank accounts. And, you know, like you make deposits every time that you spend time in, in a meaningful way. And, you know, you're paying into those accounts because there are times when, you know, you're absent and you're short and you're whatever. And you're also making withdrawals out of those bank accounts. Like last night, you getting that text of, Hey, the, the kids are, you know, maybe more yes. struggle to put to bed tonight. Exactly. No socializing after parents. Yeah, exactly. Parents, you right? just need to kind of be there when you can't, because mm -hmm. when you're not, you're, you're withdrawing from those bank accounts. And so, paying attention to kind of how you're building into them. And that love languages book, I'll talk about it just briefly afterwards, but it, like it has a lot of connections, but one of the big things about that seven habits book that for me was really, I guess, instrumental in kind of like how I want to govern myself is 
he makes a really interesting distinction that I had never really heard made about how values, like your values are like your inter- your internal compass needle that kind of like point you to where you want to go. And your values, these internal um, values that you hold are shown through your daily habits, the things you do, the things you say, how you conduct yourself. But those are different than principles. Principles are like external. Those are the things you're aiming for. That's your North Star, right? So, okay. So what are your principles? What principles are really important to you? Okay. So, you know, you can Google principles, accountability, um, like what things you want to, I mean, there's Ah, endless. So like, you know, big principles. You want to like be honest. Kind. Principle. You want to be honest mm-hmm. is a principle. You want to be accountable. You want to be those constructive. Big, constructive. constructive sure. Honesty. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's I and mean, there are dozens. I mean, you just Google principles. You're gonna come up with like a list of dozens of them. So okay, those aren't your values. Those are yeah. principles. That's what you can aim for. But your values now, you have to evaluate. Your values are like your internal compass needle that's helping point you towards those principles. And your values, your compass needle is dependent on the things you do every day. The habits that you, your habits, like your that. daily practices yeah. are determining whether your needle is pointing you to where you want to go. And so if you start evaluating your habits and stuff based on principles, so you establish what principles are most important to you. And now go look at what you, how you spend your day. Yeah. So then he yeah, talks yeah, yeah. about, okay, look at how you spend your day. Really look, not how you want to spend your day, but how did you actually spend yesterday? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If, if you're saying that relationships, strong relationships are one of your priorities, one of your principles, great. How much time yesterday did you spend cultivating your relationship mm-hmm. with the people most important to you? You know, with my kids and my wife, how much time did I spend yesterday? Not very much. If my faith, right, is one of my leading principles. Great. How much time did I spend yesterday focusing on my faith? Not very much. Mm -hmm. If like, if, and and if you prioritize your principles and then look at how you spend your day, now those things aren't going to line up because, you know, you got to work and you got to make money. And so it's not that like, you know, if your faith is your most important principle that that should take up the majority of your day. That's just not realistic. But it is a very interesting exercise in, wow, the things that I say are most important are not the things I'm spending my time on. So yeah. how is that so out of whack? Yeah. And so then the big thing that kind of comes out of it is, okay, focus on whatever your priorities are, schedule them, make time for them in the week first. Don't like schedule your week and then try and fit those things in mm-hmm. or hope that they fit in. For, hope- for students, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll study for that. Test. Totally. No, 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 no. <laughs> Write down 30 minutes of the day that right. you're going to do that. Yeah. Do it and then be done with it. Yeah. And then the rest of the time, enjoy it. Don't feel bad because yeah. you're not studying. But if you don't make time for those things, you're not, you know, you often just don't. And so what are the things you want to schedule? Anyways, that's kind of how, so I thought that was such an interesting, that one is always stuck with me, but like, okay, where's my compass needle pointing? And mm-hmm. is it pointing towards those things that I think are important in my life? Yeah. And when it's not, it's kind of like, okay, then I got to go back and course correct. And that's one thing I tell students. It's like, there's two ways to figure out what your values are. It's like, you can write them down, right? And you can live up to them or because that's hard to do. Like, you know, how many people know, how many people can list off 25 values? Right. Right. Or you can say, hey, what did you do yesterday and the day before? Right. So if reading is a value, but you haven't, you ain't picked up a book in two months. <laughs> right. Son, that ain't your value, right? No, exactly. Like if all you did was watch that's Netflix. Exactly you know? So like clearly one of my values. Like I love watching YouTube videos, right? Whether it's, whether it's, you know, particularly I'm, I'm, I'm into this one streamer, this gamer guy, but then, you know, also I have podcasts playing, right? So it's like, well, right. there's these two dichotomies of what I'm doing, but clearly watching YouTube is one right. of my values, one <laughs> yes. of my priorities or principles. Right. Right? Yes, absolutely. And then what does it fall into? It's like, is it all nonsense and gaming and whatever? Yeah. Or, you know, there's a mixture of um, learning and yeah. relaxation, right? Right. Absolutely. You need both, you know, but, you need both. but is going outside my value? No, because right. I, I obviously not. And, and, too, yeah. <laughs> and who knows, maybe that'll change over time, right? Maybe there's more opportunities to do that in the summer, but I even reflecting over the last five summers, I don't go outside. Right. Like when I was living by the U of A, sure. You know, I'd walk to the gym. So I'm outside right. and I'm exercising and I'd yeah. walk back. Okay, right. great. Right. But 
you know, do I just go out to a park, lay there in the sun with a book? No. You go out? No. Right? Me neither. So, yeah. so if that's not obviously yeah. not necessarily one of my values, you right? It's either you you create them, yes, or like from the bottom up, yeah. or you look top down. Like, well, what do I actually do? <laughs> right? right? And I like that yeah. you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that wraps up our book chat. So I guess we'll go with our runner ups. Yeah. Okay. So my runner ups, I have three. A particular book, 48 Laws of Power, which I brought yeah. here by Robert Greene, but yeah. Robert Greene's work in general, just the way it's done, the meticulousness is very enjoyable. You know, mm-hmm. it's, pr- it's like, here's a principle, here's a value. Yeah. Here's how someone did it well. Here's how someone did it poorly. Here's what you can take away. Here's what happens when you do it. Here's what happens when you don't do it. Right. Now it's yours. The information's out you there. You do what you want with it. Right. And people can get upset. Yeah. You know, kids were like, Mr. Kawaja, why do you want more power? <laughs> It's like, yeah, I don't need to entertain that, right? Like, <laughs> no. Because if you understand what Robert Greene said about his work, it, it's mostly from, hey, like people screwed me over in my life. Yeah. And I started noticing these trends, these tendencies in these industries. Here's what you, you know, just regular person going through the world should know when you yeah. get into these hyper competitive markets. Right. Right. Like, you know, 50 Cent talks about, because him and 50 Cent did a book. They talk about like, oh, really? Oh, Robert, you don't know how ruthless the music industry is. Like you were in Hollywood. Hollywood's a walk in the park to the music industry. Oh, wow. And they made their own book. So definitely Robert hmm. Greene's work. Sebastian Younger, he wrote a book called Tribe, yeah. which was so fascinating. You know, he yeah. talks about his experiences as a military journalist with these people, but he talks about how he ex- started experiencing PTSD, not because of the events he went through, but because of the alienation from the people he was around. In, in terms mm. of when he went back home to America, it'd be he'd be in the subway and it's like you'd hear a loud noise he'd think grenade everybody wow. else is thinking train right but he talks about ptsd in relation to group experience and group group shared collective stress let's say yeah you know when you're living around those types of people like for example if you live in a house full of people who train martial arts yeah pain is a part of the equation it's part of the daily life yeah working over that and, and dealing with that is part of the equation for sure but if you go to a household of sedentary people yeah. They might experience pain as well, but their pain is different. It's a very right? different kind you know? of pain. And, and, and that book was just so fascinating for how we set mm. up our lives and our communities and what what could be. Yeah. Last one. And I think over the next five, ten years of my life, this, this topic will be very necessary and relevant. But Five Levels of Leadership by John mm-hmm. C. Maxwell and yeah. leadership in general. So I'm reading a lot of books on leadership and mentoring now yeah. and, and trying to listen to podcasts. But... You know, it's interesting. Some people grasp the concept that relationship is everything, right? That's level one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that allows us to have that as teachers, the authority to lead a classroom. Right. And then when people see that, oh, you're productive and you're effective and you care. Hey, we want you to right. do these things. Right. And then from there, you can start developing leaders around you, which is what I'm trying to do, particularly with basketball coaching. And then once you've done that, you know, over the course of a lifetime, you know, you reach the pinnacle where you've developed these relationships and led people and then built leaders and they go do their own thing. And then you become known as that person. That's kind of the right. gist of that book. But leadership in yeah, general, you know, many chats with many teachers, it's just like everything just fall. One of John Maxwell's quotes that I really like is everything rises and falls on leadership. Yeah. You know, if there's opportunities, it's because of leadership. If there aren't opportunities, it's because of a lack of leadership. And so... That will be a topic that I think in the next 10 years, 15 years of my life will make a huge difference. Yeah. Not just in career. I, I know I only mentioned career, but relationships, yeah. family, career, personal life. And that's what I was going to say is exactly, even if you don't see yourself as a leader, everybody's got leadership qualities and mm-hmm. aspects of your life where, you know, you are a leader. And whether you mean to be or not, people are looking to you and taking, you know, and for, taking note of that for so. everyone, the minimum requirement is leader of one yourself. Right. Absolutely, right? Like, exactly. Don't, at the don't very let least. someone else lead <laughs> at the your very life for leader you. Right? Yeah. It will lead you into a very depressing state. Yeah, potentially. Right. I don't know. Maybe you prefer just people guiding you, telling you what to do. But yeah. having some of that autonomy and decision making, totally. Hundred percent. Yeah. Let's let's hear from you. What are your runner-ups? Uh, okay. So that five love languages book, I think everybody should read it. It's it's not so much even just about like if you're in a romantic relationship though. 
definitely applicable, but it's about how different people speak different love languages. So some people like express or like it's how different people experience love differently. So some people experience it through like physical touch. Some people it's gifts. Mm-hmm. Some people words it's of affirmation, words of affirmation and quality time. Quality time and, and, and I forgot. I can't the remember the fifth one. one. Anyways, but whatever it is, being aware of not only what other people's are, but what your own is. Mm-hmm. Because you often try and express it your own way. You know, like if I'm words of affirmation, like, you know, people build me up. Really? Great. Okay. Oh, yeah. It speaks. Yeah, it's okay. funny because... And there's a test that kind of helps. So I always try and do that. Or like, um, I'm, a, I'm all about uh, acts of kindness. That's mm-hmm. what the fifth one. So like those acts of kindness, doing things for, you know, other people. That's how I, that's mine. So like I always, you know, do tons of things for other people trying to do those to show love. That's so interesting. But that's not how they speak. It's like speaking a different language. They might not even notice. Mm-hmm. And you think that's so insulting. Mm-hmm. But it's what? not because they didn't appreciate it. It's just because it's not their love language. That's not what's right. filling their. That's not what's filling their tank. Like through and through, for me, it's physical touch. Yeah. Right. So right. like high fives, fist, fist bump, right. hand on the shoulder. Totally. Right? And with a partner, obviously different stuff yeah, as well. Yeah, for sure. And then also the kind words as well, or right. acts of kindness as well. Like, hey, right. how can I be of use? Right. right. How, how can I help? Yes. Um, but then you know what are the challenges like if you're comfortable sharing yeah, like yeah. with your wife like what is do you know her? yeah oh yeah oh yeah so she's way more like physical touch okay and um <laughs> and she acts of kindness to like a degree but time so quality, okay, quality time, time quality okay. time and physical touch so like you know the just sitting like for me i think time would be best spent like going and doing something kind for for mm-hmm. her, you know what I mean? And like, I'm always well, trying to so, think about the so, little things I could do around the house and things to kind of help and showing up when she needs you to be there. Absolutely. Right? Like, oh, and yeah, that's totally. the thing. So like, if I got home and the house was a mess, my first instinct might be, Hey, like start cleaning up because that act of kindness is going to like help, you know, but no, that's not what, that's not what necessarily she wants. She, mm-hmm. to her, it's like, well, you got home and you started cleaning, but it would have been way more helpful if you could have like just spent time and just had a conversation, just sat down and took it. Yeah, like, time. hey, we're having children yeah. melting down. Right. Forget the toys. Right. Forget Hope we'll be there exactly. later. Right? It's not exactly. It's more about just being there. Uh-huh. Present in mind. So, okay. yeah. What do you that's big one. So my other ones were um, a book called Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. It's, it's kind of similar to Atomic Habits, but it's really about how do you master those like little everyday things being aware of those little everyday things you do and how they build you as a person how they build who you are so it's really like a real practical guide to being aware of how your those little everyday actions and showing up and being present and how they give you this what he refers to as kind of a slight edge to help you like find success so i really enjoyed that book my friend had a copy of that oh yeah it's good it's worth it's Yeah. yeah it's really good and the third one is more an author than a book. If I recommend one book, it's co- it's called Grace by a guy called uh, named Mac- Max Lucado. So he writes kids books and he also writes, so he's a pastor. I don't even know exactly what denomination, but he writes these books and they're not long, but they're very, they're Bible focused, but he comes, he brings in these super practical very real life tie-ins and he makes it very much about like whatever it is you're going through in your life I don't care what it is you're going through in your life you can you will find these connections to whatever kind of the topic of the book is so he has one called grace which is really good he's got which is all about kind of like God's grace and so it is it's a very faith it's a very catholic kind of faith-based perspective but I mean he's got one called anxious for nothing which is all about um, like, how do we, oh, we're so anxious. Yeah. And, yeah. and how do we kind of let go of that and let go of that anxiety, you know, and. Cause anxiety fundamentally is, is kind of a concern for the future. Yes. Right. Right. So, which you can't really control, you know, you, there's so many things that you can't control. So kind of embracing well, and letting go of that and letting that into God's hands. And so for me, anyways, I've, I kind of always listen to these books. Like, you know, sometimes I'll mix them in. I have like a bunch of books on the go, but I always have one of these on the go. And like once in a while, often on a Monday morning when I need a little bit of like inspiration and a little perspective, Mm -hmm. they're great because they're so practical and so down to earth. And he's been through a lot. Um, 
he had some alcoholism, you know, things. So like he's got a real perspective. And so yeah, it's, he's, he's you struggled. can always get he's something. Overcome. He's struggled. Yeah. He's overcome. And you can always get something from those you need books. those reminders every now and then, yeah. right? Like just because, because, you know, I would put that into the category perspective enhancing, right? Right. Like Absolutely. Pull you out of your body and say, Hey, listen, like, let's, let's look at a look. bigger picture. Here, yes. Right. Especially like with our chat yesterday about, you know, if you're a kid and you're like, Oh, well, climate change is going to kill us all. It's like, right. Buddy, that's a problem way too big for you. <laughs> yeah. How about start? How about you focus on having like five really good friends? Yeah. And like, and like, you know what that's wow. going to lead to? That's going to lead to you. You know, if you've got five friends that are helping build you up then mm-hmm. you're going to want to rise up and that's going to lead you to other things, you know, that you're going to start challenging yourself maybe. And you may want to go start solving problems a little closer to home and, and you're going to build on that. Right. You know, I was chatting with my friends about this and they're very intelligent. They're hyper productive. They've one finishes PhD. The other one's going to finish in the next two years. And so, you know, we we're chatting about depression and, and the experience of it. And, and I agree with Peterson's sentiment of like, okay, if you're, if your room is a mess, you don't have a job, you don't have a relationship, your family life isn't well sort oriented, your health is poor. Are you depressed or do you just genuinely have a terrible life right. that your body will naturally <laughs> that, that produce negative emotion for? Right. Many people chat about this. You don't need to be a psychologist to understand it. Yeah. If you're check mark, if you're looking at the boxes of your life and there's several things that are empty, no check mark there. Hey, you have every reason to feel bad. And so coming back to that perspective, enhancing books and whatever it is yeah. that remind you that, hey, like have a little grace, you know, right. have a little, yeah. have a little, like look at the bigger picture, you know, absolutely. Our thing's going to be okay. <laughs> For sure. Let's, uh, let's quickly wrap up here. We're going to take up the whole lunch. That's okay. Okay. So. I will add for concluding thoughts. I, I like how your books go from your first one was the essay, yeah, which is very much internal. Yeah, the next one was kind of like like the body, and, and it was based on habits. Yeah, right. So once yeah. you've sorted out your internal state, what are the habits you want to do? And yeah. the third one, I'm sl- slipping my mind. What was your third? Uh, book? Then we talked about oh, the book of joy. The book of joy. Then it's like behavior. Yeah. Right. How do you yeah. how do you interact with the world once you've sorted out your internal state? your habits, and then the external, right? Like, what is your behavior? I found that very interesting. I oh, noticed that little pattern, right? It, like, it goes really from the inside all the way out. out yeah. Right? That's an interesting, yeah, I didn't thought about that, but. And do you want to maybe chat, like, why Like why books? Because people don't read. Yeah, I know. And you know what? Even I, when I say I'm reading, I listen a lot because, you know, I got a lot of drive time. Yeah. But whatever, you know what? I, I don't know. For me, there's something about books where, and I don't always read, you know, like I pick up a lot of books and I don't always get all the way through them. We've talked about that where sometimes you can read that, the first couple chapters. That's very important. You know, you should know that like whoever is listening or thinking about reading. And I've told this to some students, go through the, like, go through the chapters and yeah. see what sticks out to you yeah. and read that. That's okay. Read, you don't yeah. have to read all 300 pages of a book to get, you know, like you sometimes could read the first chapter or the chapter that applies to you and get you know, 80% of what you need out of that mm-hmm. book. And that's not to say there's other things you could get, but absolutely. So, and one thing I do is when I read the chapter, I put a check mark by it. You know, mm. I, I'm a big fan of just making the people know that the book has been read and yep. used, right? Absolutely. Fold the corners, the yep. pages, the whatever, creasing. But I'll reread the chapter and I'll put a check mark. And then slowly over time, like, so with David Data's book, it's like, okay, where are the check marks going? Because either that's something I need to work on or that mm. that's like, that's the 80-20. Like that right. one chapter provides yeah. so much value. Yes. It's like, that's like, hey, make sure you read this and understand this. Maybe I'll make a video about hey, that that's chapter. that's interesting. Yeah. But particularly with self-help books, if you're just reading a particular chapter, put a check mark down there every time you read it, every time you go back to it. Because yes. that's like a track record of, oh, I really need this stuff. Yes. And yeah, then you it. see, well, what am I ignoring? And then you come back like, oh, this book makes so much more sense. Right. Because when I first got a hold of David Data's book, I was like, what is this mumbo jumbo <laughs> esoteric yeah, spiritual trash? <laughs> yeah, I know. How am I supposed to get a that. girlfriend with this? Like, what <laughs> right. is this? Right? Yeah. A couple years later, you know, I've spent a couple years building myself up. All of a sudden, when I look at it, it's like, oh, with, with many more experience, like, right. oh, Oh, I oh, get it. it. Now, that's yeah. why that didn't work out that time. Right. Because of these issues from a core underlying level. And it's like, okay, check mark. Right. And right. A couple of weeks later, read it again, check mark. Right. Yes. But 
with books, like obviously, right, when you get busy, it's hard to read. Yeah. And reading takes a lot of time and energy and focus. Yes. Yeah. Especially now when, you know, you could be scrolling on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat. So listen to the book. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know what? And TikTok, I mean, depending who you're following, because there's a lot of authors that, you know, I'll follow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get those little... Instagram, like, you know, quick little videos, whatever of, you can get a lot from those too, depending who you're following. Mm -hmm. And so just exposing yourself to lots of different people and ideas and, and then honing in on those things. Because if you fill your feed with, you know, people that are interesting and people that have interesting thoughts, you can get a lot of the same content that you're going to get in those books on your social media, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. you know, and then you're kind of feeding yourself with those things. But I don't know. I feel like if people poured their heart and soul into a book and they took all their best thoughts and put it into a book, isn't that maybe worth a read? Like I read tons of biographies because I feel like if you can take the life of, you know, Einstein, or you can take the life of Edison, or you can take the life of like I read Will Smith's biography just last week. And it was like, you know, whatever. That's like, that's his life. And they put it into a book for you and you can read it in two or three hours. Now Boy. picking one book that didn't make this list that might have um, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yes. Right? Which, which you know, the reason why I have a poster right. in my classroom. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. There's there's so much to be gained and maybe we can end because we're... Yeah, we better. We'll end on this note of people who are well-read often say, you know, why should you read a book? Well, there's a quote by someone, you know, it's like having a conversation with the finest minds of history. <laughs> Yes. Right. Isn't that it? You can read something that has transcended multi generations. And you know, like read the Bible. Yeah. Try to understand those stories. Like why yeah. why did people stick to this story? It wasn't because they're idiots. Yeah. You know, read read some of the classics. Yeah. If, if you can get your mind around them. Yeah. Read a book that's a little older. You know, there's a reason why it stood the test of time and why the author stuck around. Read Jim Rohn, right? Yeah. Like, exactly. Love right? Jim Rohn. Yes. You know. It's still super applicable. And the thing is, like, especially like after parent teacher interviews, like maybe, you know, maybe the advice you're getting from your family isn't the best suited to your life and best suited to what's happening in modern times. Like, how do you yeah. balance all these different things that are pulling and vying for your attention? Yeah. How do you carve out yourself a path? Well, you know, engage yourself with the finest minds of history. Yes. Okay. Isn't that we'll, it? we'll end it there. Any, any last thoughts? We're no. Okay. That's great. All right. Thank you.